Today we're talking about Syria. Specifically, what are we still doing there? Noif announced we're leaving only to come back so many times that if this was a sitcom, we'd be getting married in a few seasons. As you've probably heard, our current relationship status over there is, it's complicated. And what do you know, Russia, Turkey, and Syria already liked it. Over the years, our continued objectives in Syria have shifted from, oh, oh we're not touching that, to, okay, but only to wipe ISIS off the map, to, we need to stay here to make sure that every surrounding country doesn't descend on our Kurdish allies. Now that those are no longer concerns to the president and we've announced we're gonna leave, you'd think we'd leave. Well, that was the plan for all of five minutes, but could we really leave Syria? I mean, the drama's just getting so good there. Well, we crashed on a rock's couch for a few weeks, had a good think, but then they kicked us out. I guess they still remember the last time US troops showed up to crash on their futon. Now this left us with a little bit of a pickle until we realized, maybe our job isn't done in Syria quite yet. We're gonna reinvade. I mean, we knew where they keep the key under that fake rock in the corner. Our goal this time was simple. Reposition forces in the area in order to uh, ensure we secure the oil fields. That brings us to now, because on Thursday, the Department of Defense clarified the United States' new objective in Syria. Protect the oil! Apparently, we're now taking our foreign policy cues from every political cartoon ever created about George Bush. I mean, I know our priorities probably look pretty out of whack to the Kurds, but you have to understand, we can't have oil prices going up. My goal today is to break down exactly what this new objective means from a legal and operational standpoint. First, who are we protecting the oil from? Well, that's where Head of Department of Defense Mark Esper comes in. He clarified that US troops will remain positioned in the strategic area to deny ISIS access to those vital resources, and we will respond with overwhelming military force against any group that threatens the safety of our forces there. Makes sense. Things started to get a little murkier when you realize that, well, right now Syria is in the process of being invaded by a ton of different countries, which leads to a pretty interesting follow-up question. Pressed on whether the US military mission included denying any Russian or Syrian government forces to access the oil fields, Esper said the short answer is yes, it presently does. Now this answer opens up a whole new can of worms. There are fears the US could end up in a direct conflict with new adversaries, Russians. We drove to the Conoco oil and gas refinery, now a US base. It's the first time reporters have been here since American troops came under attack on this spot last month by 500 fighters, including Russian mercenaries. Don't worry everybody, all the oil's okay. This new strategy is also raising a new question that I can't believe we find ourselves asking. As foreign policy reports, one key question is whether US forces will have the legal authority to engage Russian, Syrian, or Iranian forces who may attempt to seize the oil fields. This problem evolves around our legal authority in Syria. You see, we invaded Syria under the authorization of military force that was passed by Congress right after 9-11 and said we could attack any group that was involved. Obama said to Congress, hey, I know ISIS was formed around 2014, but look at them, they would have been involved in 9-11 in some way if they had existed. What do you say we round up a little bit? Congress wanting to attack ISIS said, sure, let's go. Problem is, if you think that's a stretch, good luck tying 9-11 to Russia. The 2001 AUMF does not give US forces the authorization to fire on state actors such as Russia, Iran, or Syrian forces unless they are acting in self-defense. It seems like our strategy here is a little bit stand your ground-esque. Sure we can't attack you, but if you get too close, we're gonna launch a preemptive strike. We saw something close to this with one of our other Syrian bases in the south. The US has established a protective circle around the base that's called a deconfliction zone. Basically, it means cross into that circle uninvited and you risk an American attack. But the pro-regime forces advance anyway. The Americans strike. 
saying it's in self-defense. So, you know, just everyone steer clear of the oil fields and we'll be all good. As the Pentagon's chief spokesperson Jonathan Hoffman said, everyone in the region knows where American forces are. We are very clear with anybody in the region in working to deconflict where our forces are. We work to ensure that no one approaches or shows hostile intent to our forces. And if they do, our commanders maintain the right to self-defense. Great, so our new strategy is essentially get off my lawn. So that's part of our strategy, and if you want serious oil, you're gonna have to go through us. Now to part two of this strategy, because unfortunately if America takes that oil, well, that's an international and domestic war crime, although when has that ever stopped us before? Instead of legally speaking pillaging Syria, we have a different strategy. Okay, yes, we are going to take that oil and sell it, but that revenue from the oil will go towards the Kurds, not to the United States as Trump has previously signaled. The Kurds will use those funds to strengthen their campaign against the Islamic State. Yeah, for whatever reason right now, there are suddenly a ton of ISIS soldiers in Kurdish territories. So now the Kurds will have the funds to fight them again. Let's just hope they don't use that cash to you know, fight our other ally, Turkey. So now that we know what the US's new strategy is, let's zoom out a bit, because unsurprisingly, there are some pretty big ramifications of this new strategy. Starting with the big one, Russia is really, really annoyed. This is because three weeks ago we saw, in a political and military shift, Kurdish-led forces are to deploy side by side with Syrian government troops in the Kurdish-controlled region at the country's border with Turkey. Now, the deal was announced after the United States ordered the withdrawal of most of its troops in Syria. Yeah, after we left, the Kurds needed some protection, so they were on the receiving end of a pretty one-sided negotiation. After the United States withdrew, the Kurds were forced to negotiate a deal with the Syrian regime and its Russian backers for protection against the Turkish invasion. Damascus and Moscow were eagerly eyeing the potential oil revenue and not happy with the continued US presence. We're back everyone, did you miss us? Wait, you got back together with Syria? Well, I guess we'll just seize all of your valuable land and shoot anybody who gets close. So this brings us to the final level of focus, because now that we have all of the layers of perspective on this issue, we can now talk about the glaring pros and cons of this strategy. Of course, there's the obvious criticism that we're essentially screaming to the entire world the unspoken part of American foreign policy. Assad, the Syrian leader that America has opposed from the beginning, recently said, Trump was the best American president for his complete transparency about intentions to maintain control of Syria's main oil fields in Delir al Zor province. Now, if you're confused and thinking, was that just a really weird compliment? He went on to clarify that Trump's decision to keep a small number of US troops in the Kurdish held areas of Syria, where they have the oil, showed that Washington was a colonial power that was doomed to leave once Syria resist their occupation, as in Iraq. Yeah, this doesn't look great. More to the point though, there are some real concerns regarding Russia, Turkey, and Syria's newfound anger with the Kurds. I mean, their goal here was that oil. The Kurds fear that Russia, angered by the United States' continued presence at Deir al-Zor, may open the airspace along the border to the Turks, enabling Turkish airstrikes on the border town of Kobani. Man, those guys could not catch a break. In a very unflattering metaphor, think about it like this. The Kurds were abandoned by the gang that used to protect them, so they turned to a new gang as they were now being attacked. On their way to delivering the protection money to that new gang, well, they were mugged by their old protecting gang, so now they don't have the protection money anymore. Everybody's angry at everybody else, and only one group is small enough to attack. Even more confusing, now we're paying them with the oil revenue and saying we want to give them air support against ISIS, but not Turkey, so nobody's really sure where their alliances rest. Do they work with the people they split off from, or the people who split off from them? 
Now if you can overlook all of that, there's one big morally dubious pro. We have the protection money. It gives the United States some leverage because Russia and Assad are dying for the oil. Unless they want to take it from us with force, they're going to have to negotiate with us for Syria's natural resources. Now I'm not sure what these negotiations will look like, I mean it's a lot of oil. They might have to launch investigations into both Warren and Sanders for us to give up this one. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'm proud to announce that I just opened up a Patreon account. Special thanks to Eric Webster, Skeeter Zimble, Wayne Cardoza, and Yin Centeno for becoming my first four patrons. If you want to join, there's a link in the description. To support independent, nonpartisan news, remember to click subscribe by clicking on that floating logo to the right of my head. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring and give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, Thank you for watching.